Hello and welcome to today's lecture on artificial intelligence. Today we shall finish the topic of hidden Markov models and we should also discuss the expectation maximization algorithm, which is one of the very famous algorithms in machine learning and in maximum likelihood estimation actually. Um, from the next week, you should have three lectures uh, that will be given by Radek Marík on planning, on scheduling and constraint satisfaction problems. So we will probably see us only during the seminars. So let's get to the place where we finished last week. So we talked about Markov models as, let's say, a specialization of Bayesian networks where the individual variables describe some state variables either in space or in time. And we talked about uh, two assumptions that basically make uh, the Markov models acceptable. And that's the Markov assumption that tells us basically that given one state, the current state, basically the future and the past is independent, which does not hold in this model, right? You have to have something like this model where really the future and the past are independent. Uh, this Markov assumption does not really or is not sufficient to really make the reasoning tractable. You also need the stationarity assumption, which means that the transition model from one state to the other is always the same right it does not change in time so that are the two fundamental assumptions of markov model <clears throat> we talk about uh, what are the independence assumptions how we can describe the individual parts of the markov chain using either conditional probability table transition diagram or trellis and we talked also about uh, a prediction algorithm in Markov chain that allows you to predict your beliefs or uh, pass forward your beliefs about hidden states in time, right? And if you pass it sufficiently far enough to the future, you usually get to a stationary distribution of that Markov chain, which can be, for many cases, basically derived analytically because this equation must hold for the stationary distribution. So you can compute it without a simulation. And we also talked that the Google PageRank algorithm is one of the famous examples of playing the mark <coughs> chains and their stationary distributions. And then we already switched to the hidden Markov models. We said that the Markov models themselves are not that interesting because they do not allow us to describe uh, the real world with sufficient uh, fidelity, I would say, uh, because in the real world, very often parts of the states are not observable. So the model that hidden Markov models apply looks like this, that you have a mark chain of his states that like this, right? And hidden state or the hidden each time is a is responsible for producing 
some kind of observations which can be really observed in the real space. So all those inference algorithms uh, that we will talk about with respect to the hidden Markov models somehow try to estimate the hidden states for, uh, for which we do not have the observations, basically. We cannot observe them, but we can estimate their state. Yeah, so this is the description of the joint probability model uh, factorized by the hidden Markov model, basically. So this is the initial distribution or the initial state at time zero. And then you have this transition model that describes how one hidden state can transform into the next hidden state. And you have this sensor model that describes uh, what is the probability distribution of individual observations given some hidden state. And we also introduced uh, the weather umbrella domain as a running example in this in this talk, uh, where basically the task is to estimate whether it is uh, rainy or sunny weather. outside, there should be two ends in the sunny, based on the fact whether your boss brings an umbrella or not with him. You have no, um, no option to observe the, the weather outside directly. You must only infer the state from the observations from the umbrellas given, of course, the transitional model and the emission model. And we defined uh, something like six tasks uh, that are very typical for hidden Markov models. The first one was filtering, in which you want to estimate the probability distribution over the current state, which is the xt here, given the sequence of observations from time one to the current time. And last week during the exercises, we also implemented this forward algorithm that is able to do this estimation. And uh, I think that most of you actually implemented that algorithm quite fine. The other task that we talked uh, with respect to hidden Markov model is the prediction, which is the task of predicting some future state given sequence of observations, which is basically just a applying two algorithms in sequence because you first um, apply filtering or forward algorithm to estimate the probability distribution of xt given the observation sequence. And then you apply the mini forward algorithm from the xt on to actually find the distribution over xt plus k. Because for from t plus 1 to t plus k, you don't have any observations. The third algorithm that uh, we will discuss today, it will be one of the main topics, is a smoothing that tries to precisely or more precisely model the probability distribution of some past state given uh, the observations from one to the current time. So you can have this, this estimate basically from filtering algorithm, but that estimate, meaning the filtering algorithm will give you pxk given e from one to k, right? This is what filtering does. But if you have some more observations, uh, so you have an observation sequence from time one to time k, 
and you want to estimate the probability distribution over this hidden state xk right but if you get new observations from time k to time t you want to also account for this new sequence of observations to update your beliefs over the past state so this will be the smoothing algorithm that we will talk about today and then other three algorithms uh, yeah recognition or evaluation of statistical model basically this is the algorithm that allows you to compute the likelihood of the model given the data given the observations and this can be done also by forward algorithm and you should have done it last week in the labs because it is just really an application of forward algorithm with some subtle difference but it can be done quite easily another task that we will talk today about is the most likely explanation which means finding the most likely sequence of state states that could generate the sequence of observations we will define this task more precisely when we get to it it will be solved by the so-called Viterbi algorithm <coughs> excuse me and the last uh, task related to hidden markov models is actually learning the model from data and that will be partially covered in uh, the second part of the talk when we will switch to the EM algorithm uh, where the baum welsh algorithm is actually a special case. So let's move on to the part where we left last week. So we discussed filtering. You should have already implemented the filtering algorithm. So there is nothing new here. Model evaluation, we talked about this, the likelihood message. <clears throat> and that's where we ended probably. Yes. So now let's talk about smoothing. I already said that it is something like if you have a long observations sequence of observations from time one to time t you want to use all this the whole sequence to actually estimate the probability over the hidden state at time k right so you want to use not only the first part as would be done in filtering but also the rest to actually update your belief with the future data so how this could be done again we will do some let's say modifications to these equations to get to the uh, actual equations that tell us how to do these updates so the first thing that we will do is that we will split this observation sequence from time one to time t into basically two sequences right from one to k and from k plus one to t and if you apply bias rule to this uh, to this expression basically you can rewrite this conditional probability as the multiplication of these things so it is basically the probability of the future observations given the current state and past state uh, and past observations times the probability of the current state given past observations and the alpha here is for standardizing the whole distribution it must still be a distribution over states 
by applying the Markov assumption, you can basically get rid of the past observations because the future observations are not dependent on the past observations if you know the current state, the state at time k. If you look very closely to this thing here, you will recognize that it is basically the result of the filtering, right? It is that quantity which is updated by filtering task and computed by the forward algorithm. So we know how to compute this part. The question is how to compute this, right? How to compute this um, probability of future observations given the current state. And now we have somewhat longer uh, derivation of how to compute it. So now we just, right, we just take this part and we try to find how to compute it. So the first thing that you can do is to introduce the future hidden state into that uh, probability distribution because this uh, distribution over the future sequences of observations can be computed from this if you zoom out the future states, right? So you can introduce it here and compute it via this summation. Now again, from bias rule, you can basically compute this quantity in somewhat different way. Uh, and again, by applying the Markov assumption, you can get rid of this current state here. If you know the next state, so this is again simplification due to the Markov assumption. Uh, then you can again split the evidence sequence similarly as we have done here, but yeah, in a similar manner, but uh, at a different time step. And using the conditional in independence, you can split this first part into basically two, into the multiplication basic of two probability distributions. Because probability of EK plus one is independent on the probabilities of future sequences from time K plus T, uh, sorry, K plus two, if you know the next hidden state. And you get to this final equation where you should recognize basically the sensor model, which is part of the hidden Markov model specification. You should recognize the transition model, which is also part of the hidden Markov model specification. So you know these probabilities. And here you should recognize basically the same quantity as is as the one that we try to compute here, but in time instant plus one, basically, in the next time step. So again, we will get some kind of recursive uh, computation where we will start at the end and we will propagate something backwards in time. So this is the equation that we have just derived, right? And if you define, well, if you remember the forward algorithm, we have defined there something that we called forward message. And we propagated this forward message from the beginning to the end of uh, the Markov model. Here, we will define something similar. We will define a backward message. 
and it is by definition the probability of future observations given the current state okay and it can be computed like this it is basically the um, this equation here at the top just written with those backward messages so you have the backward messages in time k plus one and using the emission and transition model you will compute the backward message in time k so you will be based on the future backward message and uh, future observation you will compute the current backward message and you will back propagate the backward message from the end where you initialize this backward message at the end of the hidden markov model you will initialize it to the vector of ones and you will back propagate it up to time k basically And now if you put these two things together, meaning the, mm, on the first slide, when we talked about smoothing, we found that basically this quantity that we want to compute can be decomposed uh, or can be comp from the forward message and from backward message. Right, so you have two parts, the forward messages and backward messages, and you just multiply the correspondent, basically vet vectors, you, stand, uh, you normalize the distribution, and that's it. That's the quantity that you wanted to compute. So the smoothing, the task, is solved basically by something that we called forward-backward algorithm not very imaginative name but it basically describes what the algorithm does you first start by propagating the forward messages from time one to time t basically or k and then you compute the backward messages by propagating them from time k backwards right accounting for the future information and then you just multiply these two things normalize and you have what you want uh, yeah the smoothing of the whole sequence if you if you are not really interested in just this probability of the state at time k but you are interested in the whole sequence of smooth estimates over time one to time t uh, then it can be computed efficiently by actually running a forward path first and storing or remembering all the filtered estimates of k so all the forward messages will be remembered from time one to time t and then you start the backward pass from time t down to time one. And on the fly, you basically compute the backward messages and you multiply them with the corresponding forward message. You normalize and you have the probability distribution or estimate of the probability distribution um, at time k. Uh, okay, so what is the difference between filtering and smoothing on an example? Uh, this is something that we already computed last week, right? So imagine that we have three days. Oh, three days now. Okay, you start at day zero and you have no idea what the weather was at, the, at day zero, but then at day one, your boss brought an umbrella with you and we computed using the forward updates the probability of rain at day one given the observation whether the umbrella was brought 
on day one. And that filtered estimate was 75 to 25. And then on day two, we get a new observation. Your boss brought an umbrella again. So we are able to compute basically the probability of rain on day two, given your boss brought an, uh, the umbrella on day one and on day two. And this estimate using the forward algorithm only is 84% versus 15% percent or something like that. So we applied only the forward algorithm, right? So we at the first step we had only the p at time zero. In the second step we used the initial estimate and one observation to estimate this uh, the probability distribution at x1, right? So we had this information, we had this belief, and we were trying to estimate this. And at day two, we basically had the prior belief, and we had this estimate here. Now this was a known thing, because it was known from the previous step, right? And now we get a new observation here and we want to estimate this thing x2 basically using the previous estimate at x1 and using the current observation but if you are in this situation then you can actually make the estimate of this state even more precise because because you can account for this information too right for the observation at time t this will also bring you some information about the state at time one so you can compute a new thing you can basically instead of computing probability of r1 given umbrella one umbrella two uh, sorry umbrella one you can compute a more precise estimate of r1 using both of these events that were observed so you basically compute the second term uh, yeah this is from the forward algorithm and this is the backward message that you need to compute for time one. And this backward message is computed like this. So you start, uh, sorry, with the backward message at time two, and you use the emission model and the transition model, which translates to these numbers here. This is the initialization at the end of the hidden Markov model uh, to vector of ones, right? And you get a new estimate of, uh, sorry, uh, you get the backward message. And by employing this backward message, sorry, forward message and backward message and renormalizing, you get a new estimate of the probability distribution at time one. If you compare it with this, you can say that uh, using these calculations, we actually now think that the probability of rain on day one is even bigger because we also observed the umbrella on day two. And because rain tends to persist in our transition model, and because the rain and umbrella are basically very positively correlated then probably the observation of umbrella at time two will strengthen our belief that it rains also on day one so that was a very simple application of the 
forward and the backward part of the algorithm. And the whole forward backward algorithm basically looks like this. This is the forward part. And this is the backward part. So you first compute the forward messages for all the times from one to T as you have done in forward algorithm. And then you start from the end of the hidden Markov model. And you basically use the current backward message and the forward message for time T to compute the smooth estimate because the backward message is initialized to all ones, then actually the last smooth estimate will be the same as the last filtered estimate, right? Because only this fi will play any role because b is full of ones. So ft and st will be the same. And only in the second step, the backward message will be changed because you take the previous value and the observation and you compute the uh, the updated uh, estimate of the backward message. And you do that for all the time steps and you are basically done. So the algorithm is not really hard or involved, but yeah, <clears throat> you must uh, take care when implementing it uh, to use the right indices of the forward and backward messages. We will see that uh, later in the afternoon in the lab sessions. Okay, and the uh, last big piece of algorithm that we will talk about for hidden Markov models is basically the algorithm for computing the most likely sequence of hidden states. So let's introduce it by an example. If you have this weather umbrella domain, let's assume that you observed your boss over five continuous days. So this is the sequence of observations from day one to day five. And you can see that he brought his umbrella on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, maybe. And only on Wednesday, uh, there is a day where he did not bring his umbrella with him. And now the question is, what is the most likely sequence of states that explains these observations. So what is the most likely sequence of the weather outside on Monday to Friday? There are a few approaches that you can basically apply. Um, we can, in principle, enumerate all possible sequences of hidden states, right? So you have this trellis graph for five days and each path, each unique path through these states or through this graph is one possible sequence of weather outside. So it may be rainy, 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 rainy all five days or it may be rainy, not rainy, 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 not rainy, or something like that. So there are basically for our example, uh, 32 different state sequences, R1 to five. And you can enumerate all these 32 uh, options, and you can also compute the probability basically the joint probability of each of the sequences of the hidden states plus the one sequence of observations that we made, right? 
So this will be constant, this part, and here you will have 32 options. And by evaluating this probability, you can then choose that sequence of hidden states that has the largest probability or that results in largest probability. And that's it. You can do that in principle. But this is, of course, intractable for much longer sequences because this uh, exponential uh, dependence on the length of the sequence will make it in intractable very quickly. So another idea that you can use is something like this. If we have the smoothing algorithm, basically you may have this uh, set of possible states for time one, set of possible states for time two, set of possible states for time three, etc. And by using the forward-backward algorithm for smoothing, you can basically compute these distributions like px1 given the sequence from 1 to t, then px2 given the sequence from 1 to t, then px3 given the sequence from 1 to t. And this can be computed using the forward-backward algorithm. And you can then choose the most probable state for each of the time instants. And maybe if you construct this sequence of most likely states like this, you can get something that you can use, right? The issue here is that this is not the same as the most likely sequence of states. Think about what you hear. On one hand, you have sequence of most likely states. On the other hand, you have most likely sequence of states. These are different things, right? So this approach with the using forward-backward algorithm to find the sequence of most likely states cannot be used because you can basically uh, found um, examples, for example, where this transition for, may not be possible in the, in the transitional model at all. So this particular combination of xt minus 1 and xt may have zero probability in this uh, transition model, and yet it may be part of the sequence of most likely states. This is not what you want. You really want a plausible sequence of states, so such that it may be possible to really generate it using the transitional model. So you must really do it in a different way. And the way how we will do it is to actually find the most likely sequence of the hidden states. Again, it will result in a recursive algorithm. And this algorithm is basically uh, based on the observation that if you have, you know, the hidden state at time t and you have some possible hidden states. So maybe if you find that uh, the most likely sequence of states will end up at time t at this particular state, then it is probably possible 
to get there from any of these states, but from the beginning to that state, and to that state, and to that state, these will have to be again the most likely sequences how to get to the state x t minus one right so if you knew the most likely sequence is how to get to time uh, sorry to state uh, to individual state at time t minus one you can use it to quite easily compute the most likely sequence how to get from the start to time x t because one of these most likely sequences will be probably part also to the most likely sequence how to get to that uh, particular state. So we will again define some kind of recursive relationship between the most likely path to each state at time t minus one and the most likely path to each state at time x t, at time t, sorry. How this is done? Again, we will use some kind of message that will be passed through the, the hidden Markov model. Um, note that this probability and this probability are basically the same things only this one is normalized right to get the distribution over the sequences of hidden states but you can basically interchangeably work with either this or this without sacrificing the the sequence of hidden states, right? So let's work with this joint probability distribution because it will be somewhat simpler. And we will define the so-called max message as this thing. It will be the probability, <coughs> sorry, it will be again a vector over the possible values of state right and that vector will be also here but to compute the max message for each individual item in that vector you need to find the maximum of this probability across the previous hidden state values so you must basically find from which previous state uh, the path to the current state will give you the maximum probability. Now again, you can try to modify this uh, probability and to split those sequences in a way. And you will then find that, again, you will use the emission model here. <coughs> you will use the transition model here and you will use the max message from the previous step so it seems to be well you will get this final uh, update equation for the max messages uh, it is quite similar to what we did in forward algorithm with the exception of this maximization here so for each stage you need to find the basically maximum or the best predecessor of the state if you then want to reconstruct the sequence or the most likely sequence of states you need to remember or to store for each state at time t you need to remember the best predecessor at time t minus one so you basically need to uh, remember for which x, x time minus one 
this probability actually was the maximal one. Okay. And this is an example uh, of our, of the solution of our example. In the max messages, the M1 is actually uh, initialized by the forward step. So you first, the max message is equal to the first forward message. But then you start applying uh, this recursive equation for the max messages for time two, three, four, and five. And you basically compute these max messages for each of those hidden states. And those bold arrows here basically tells you what is the best predecessor. So for example, if you want to get to this state, which gives you the maximum probability for time two, you must have passed to this state from this previous state, right? So you remember that the best predecessor of this state is this one. And you remember this for all these things, right? So these black arrows actually uh, suggest the way how the max messages are propagated, but you must remember the way backwards, right? So for each of these states, you remember the previous best state here. The same for the lower part, but as you can see, it's for our example, it looks quite um, monotonously with the exception of this state where the best pre uh, predecessor is also this, this part here. So the Viterbi algorithm basically does the forward propagation of the max messages. So you compute these numbers. And once you get to the end, you look at those things and you find the maximum, which is here, right? This is the probability, the likelihood of the whole sequence. And now you only follow the, the remembered arrows. So the previous state in the maximal sequence was this one. The previous state in the maximal sequence was this one. The previous state was this one. And again, the previous state was this one. On the way backwards, where you reconstruct the sequence of states, you do not consider the numbers inside them at all. You just consider the remembered predecessors, the arrows, basically. So what we have found here is that even though our observation was such that our boss did not bring his umbrella on day three, the maximum likelihood sequence of hidden states, the, maximum likely, the maximally likely sequence of weather outside, is that it was raining the whole week and the Wednesday absence of umbrella is maybe just by the boss forgetting it to bring it to work with him. So this is basically the Viterbi algorithm um, that we will implement in the afternoon as well. And it is a kind of important algorithm because uh, it is also it is also used, for example, in telecommunications when you have some noisy channel uh, over which some message is passed. Then you can basically reconstruct the most likely sequence of input uh, letters in some alphabet, given the observed sequence of the output letters. 
right? So even though there is some kind of noise and corruption of the message over the, that channel, you can use this Viterbi algorithm to reconstruct the most likely input to basically correct some errors during the, the message transmission. So it was very important algorithm for telecommunications. And that's basically all I wanted to say about hidden Markov models. So do you feel that uh, you have some questions about hidden Markov models right now that you would like to ask? So if there are no questions regarding HMMs, then we will switch to the second part of the talk, which is about the EM algorithm. And I'm not sure whether I will uh, manage to go through this presentation uh, as a whole but uh, it doesn't matter much despite well the EM algorithm is important so you should be aware of its existence you should be aware of what it can do for you but I will not include include it in in the in the exam at all so yeah if we will not manage to do something about it then you can ask me later or if you are interested and uh, or study it at home but i i hope that we will manage a big part of it okay so em algorithm is basically a an important tool for maximum likelihood estimation or maximum a posteriori estimation which are some statistical methods how to estimate something unknown from the observations or how to fit probabilistic models basically so let me reiterate the maximum likelihood estimation what it is and how it works we have discussed this uh, a few times in at the first lecture and uh, yeah excuse me i was just switching off my phone great so let's reiterate what a likelihood maximization stands for the problem that you have is that you have some data which are observed and you would like to um, evaluate some candidate models or candidate set of parameters of a particular model with regard to that data set x and this can be done by computing the probability of generating that data set x given those parameters or given that model so this notation somehow emphasizes that this distribution of uh, the data x is parameterized by some set of parameters or by some values of parameters theta And you can define as some kind of learning task that if you have a training data set T, you would like to choose from some set of candidate models, the one that maximizes the probability of generating this observed training data set. That's basically maximum likelihood estimation. So, what you can compute usually is the probability of that training data set given the model or given the model parameters. And because the individual uh, 
uh, observations in the training data set are independent and identically distributed, you can express the probability of the whole data set as the product of probabilities of individual observations in that data set. And because you use this probability of the training data set given that model to describe how well uh, the data, uh, sorry, the model fits the data set, you usually use this quantity called likelihood, which is you must you may think about it as a function of the model parameters with the parameter uh, with the training data set as the parameter of that function so you can basically then say it's the likelihood of the model or likelihood of the parameters with respect to the data set t okay uh, how you would like to select the, what, what are the optimal parameters or what what is the optimal model well the one that maximizes the likelihood of that model given for that training data and because you can decompose this likelihood to product of individual probabilities over the training data set you can write this and very often you will also uh, do this log likelihood trick where you define the log likelihood to be just the logarithm of the likelihood why because it is uh, much easier to work with and the values the values of theta for which uh, the likelihood and log likelihood attains its maximum is the same because likelihood uh, sorry logarithm is a monotonous function and this does not change the position of the optimum it changes the value of the optimum but not the position and we search for the position here using this arg max function so very often you will search for maximum likelihood by maximizes this maximizing this quantity so this is an introduction to likelihood basically um, if you allow me i will skip this quiz question because uh, i don't have so much time uh, this question was just about testing your knowledge or your feeling or <laughs> opinion about maximum likelihood estimates for the normal distribution uh, all the four options are the same they are just using different you know denominators here at these ratios and the question was which of these things is actually the maximum likelihood estimates for uh, the normal distribution and uh, you were basically taught or you should be taught in the school that you should divide by n when computing the sample average and you should divide by n minus 1 when computing the sample stand, uh, standard deviation or uh, or uh, well, the standard deviation squared. No, I I lost the right word for that term. Sorry for that. So these are the best estimates from many points of view that you can get. But the variance. Thank you, Domenico Dania. Variance. Thank you. Um. Uh, so option C is actually the thing that you should use from statistical perspective because these estimates are unbiased. So they do not systematically over or underestimate the, the real values. But what maximum likelihood estimation gives you is basically option D, right? It leads to one over N here and one over N here. So it leads to a biased estimate here uh, for the variance at least. 
So that's just the point of, uh, of this quiz question. Now I want to turn your attention to the case where we have incomplete data, basically. If you have a training data set, you can basically uh, use some candidate uh, parameter value theta. And you can compute the likelihood of theta and the training data set. So that is what we have talked about right now. But imagine if you have incomplete data or data where you can observe only part of them. So maybe you can observe this X. This is the training data X. And there is some hidden part that we will denote K. But you cannot observe these data here. So you cannot basically use this process as in the above case. You cannot compute the likelihood of the parameters given the data set T because you don't have this data set T. You have only this first part. Right, but this data, this hidden thing here, is there. Only we we don't know what values they have. So what you can actually do is that you can somehow describe this part of data set by a probability of the hidden part given the observable part and the model parameter theta. Uh, this is something that you can do. But now, because the, this part of the data set can have quite a lot of values, basically all admissible values that are <laughs> basically governed by this distribution can be observed there in principle with certain probability. So now you cannot compute the likelihood, but you can compute something like expected likelihood. right of the of the uh, sorry of the parameter theta and the training data set given that the part uh, that is unobservable is distributed using the probability of k given theta and x Um, yeah, so this is basically how you can replace the likelihood, the one number that you compute here, by basically a, another number which has the meaning of expected likelihood of the training data if you know this, the, the distribution of the hidden data given the observable part and the model parameters. And this will form the basis basically of the expectation maximization algorithm. At least you should understand this, not yeah, because the EM algorithm builds on this understanding. So yeah, this is what I have just observed, uh, sorry, described. So if you had an incomplete data set, where is the observable and hidden part, you basically cannot compute the log likelihood of the data set because you don't have access to the hidden part. 
but you may try to maximize the likelihood of uh, the model with respect to the observable part by computing this, which would translate into computing this logarithm of summation. But this summation inside the logarithm, yeah, usually you get some complicated expressions, which is not very fine to use it uh, to to compute. But you can use this probability, conditional probability about the hidden part of the training data set given the observable part and the model parameters. And you can define the complete data log likelihood or likelihood like this, right? But now it is a random variable. It is not just a single number. It is a random variable governed by this distribution. <coughs> So instead of optimizing the likelihood directly, you try to maximize this uh, expected likelihood. And usually this must be done in a two-way procedure or two-step procedure, uh, which we will just describe. The general EM algorithm is uh, yeah, a kind of general method of finding the maximum likelihood estimates of probability distribution parameters. If you have some missing data or incomplete data, and these hidden variables uh, are very often present in our models, basically, for example, in hidden Markov models, those are those axes which, can't, which we can't observe. And EM algorithm is actually not a single, a single concrete algorithm. It is a family of algorithms or recipes to derive a maximum likelihood estimation algorithm for various kinds of probabilistic models. So if you apply EM algorithm to hidden Markov model learning, you will get the Baum-Welsh algorithm. If you apply EM algorithm to learn Gaussian mixture models, you will get something close to k-means algorithm of clustering and we will see the examples right now and i i said that this em algorithm works in two steps basically and here you may actually observe the expected likelihood of uh, the parameters, how you can compute it, right? You consider all the possible hidden parts of the training data set. You compute its probability given the observable part and the model parameters. And you try to compute basically the weighted uh, the weighted average of this log likelihood of the complete data. So this is just the white time the likelihood, right? The likelihood is random variable because the hidden part changes and the whites are given by this probability distribution. The issue here is that you need to know the parameters of the model to compute the this white, basically, this conditional probability distribution. But in the same time, you would like to use this, uh, this uh, expected likelihood to tune the parameters of the model. So how you can tune something that you need to know to compute the quantity, right? So that's why this iterative scheme was devised that you will basically pretend that you know the uh, theta values. You start by some initial values. And that's this quantity, right? This is the part that is fixed, the pretended that you know. 
this allows you to compute this wide, this probability of uh, the probability distribution over the hidden parts of the training data set and allows you to basically tune these parameters theta here, right? So you basically define this quantity. This is fixed and this is a variable thing. And then you take this quantity and you try to maximize it across this variable thing. And this gives you the new estimates of the par model parameters for the next iteration. So it will basically iterate these two steps, the E and M step, and it will make more and more precise estimate of the model parameters. Yeah, the algorithm features, these are the pros or pluses. Uh, basically, you can also find the estimates using other numerical optimization methods, but the EM algorithm basically exploits the structure of the model, which allows it to converge faster. And if this probability distribution is from an exponential family where, for example, the Gaussian distributions and exponential distributions belong, then the M step of the algorithm can be done analytically. So you don't have to search for the best new parameters, you just compute them. And yeah. And the most important features feature of EM algorithm is that the probability of the observable data set gets bigger or at least stays the same um, in the process of uh, iterating. So you can only improve your estimates and the algorithm works well in is that's yeah just an observation uh what are its cons cons meaning minuses or disadvantages uh it is only a local search algorithm basically it doesn't guarantee to get to globally optimal estimate and the maximum likelihood estimation can overfit the convergence is uh, yeah is fine with regard to this this equation here. You can only improve, but the convergence itself may be slow. So that's are the mm, the disadvantages. Now let's look at individual, let's say incarnations of EM algorithm that you can uh, that you can find or that you can maybe already, uh, that you already saw somewhere. Uh, maybe you would be surprised, but the clustering algorithm k-means can be also described as a particular instance of EM algorithm. Maybe just a quick poll among you. Do you know k-means algorithm? Yes or no? So yeah, the answers are coming. So the majority of you knows k-means, that's great. Uh, okay, so thank you. So k-means is a clustering algorithm. Clustering is uh, an algorithm in unsupervised learning where you basically don't have any target classes or target values that you want to predict as in classification or in regression. You just have the data and you unsupervisingly, <laughs> unsupervisedly, sorry, uh, play with the data and you look for structures, interesting structures for in the data. So some important directions that describe the data set 
or some important clusters, right? If, if they are present in the data, etc. So k-means is a clustering algorithm. So it tries to search for some clusters, so for some subsets of points which lie close together and far from uh, points in other clusters. Uh, yeah. So the k-means algorithm basically works like this. You are given the number of k, which is the number of clusters that the algorithm tries to search for in the data. And the algorithm works uh, in several steps that initially it chooses a centroid for each cluster. And this can be done in many ways. Very often the cluster centers uh, are selected as one of the examples in the training data set, right? So you just select K random examples from the data set as the cluster center. And then you go through all the training data. And for each data point, you assign it to the closest cluster center. So after this stage, after point two, each point is assigned to one cluster. And in step three, you take the points in one cluster and you compute their average. And this average will become your new cluster center. And then you basically iterate these two steps. It can be shown basically that the algorithm minimizes some loss function, which may be defined like this. It's not that important for us today. Uh, the algorithm is quite fast, but it also can converge to some local optimum of that uh, function j. And here we will have kind of illustration. So imagine that this is your data set, the data points that you see there. And initially, we chose these three data points as the initial cluster centers. Then you go through all the data points and you assign each data point to that closest cluster center. So this data point is the only one which is assigned well together with the center uh, to this center. Then all these green points are basically assigned to this center of cluster. And these blue points are assigned to this center of cluster. And now you compute the averages of these green points, the red point and the blue points. And these become your new cluster centers for the next iteration. So these arrows here basically denote how the cluster centers move from one iteration to another to the other okay so this is the average of all the green points this is the average of the blue points etc and if you run it basically a few iterations and you will observe that the whole process somehow converges that the you know, the changes of the cluster centers are only after a few iterations small, and that's it. Uh, yeah. So this is the final division to three clusters of this data set, and that would be the final division that the k-means algorithm outputs to you as a result. So how you, we can view the k-means algorithm as an instance of expectation maximization. You may basically assume that an object can be in one of k states with full probabilities. So for each observation, uh, you basically remember in what state to what cluster it belongs. And you also know 
uh, these probability distributions where k is the number of uh, the cluster number and this distribution describes the probability density function of each cluster and they are assumed to be isotropic gaussians because isotropic gaussians uh, as their level sets in the form of concentric circles which are basically dependent only on the distance from the center right and that's what the k-means algorithm uses to assign all points to the closest cluster center so basically the em algorithm sorry the k-means algorithm uh, has some kind of recognition part that tries to estimate to which uh, to which cluster each individual type belongs, which is basically a part of the E step, and the rest of the E step and the M step is basically this recomputation of cluster centers, which is done by computing the average of points in one cluster. But it can be described like this, that uh, this is basically the E step and this is the M step. Somewhat more involved is the application of EM algorithm to mixture models. Uh, a mixture model is something that can be described like this, right? So you have this joint probability over the observable observations and hidden states and you have this prior distribution of hidden states and the conditional distribution of uh, observations given the hidden states why it is a mixture well because the observations x can be described by this mixture right the sum of several parts where each part has some prior probability and the probability of observation given that part and what we want to learn when we learn the mixture distribution is actually to learn these mixing coefficients so these a priori probabilities and also the parameters of this distribution this may be again some kind of gaussian maybe these are just numbers right this is yeah just numbers uh, for mixture distribution uh, okay i will maybe just go directly to em algorithm for gaussian mixture because this is most uh i say straightforward thing yeah i can't i must go here so for general mixture distribution you can uh, have a similar step as similar steps as in k-means algorithms you again will do some recognition in k means the recognition means finding to what cluster each individual belongs now this is more fuzzy let's say it like this let's say it this way and you can actually assume that each observation belongs to all clusters but with different degree okay so one cluster may be highly responsible for that data point it is highly probable that the data point is generated by that cluster but there is other smaller probability that the other cluster will will generate that point too so the clusters are not um, are not crisply separate they are over one sense so uh, instead of computing to which cluster each individual observations belongs you may compute these we call it responsibilities 
So how, to what degree each particular cluster is actually responsible for that observation. And it is basically this probability of uh, cluster given the observation. Uh, yeah, so if you compute these gammas, these responsibilities, you have the first part of the EM algorithm, and then you can use these responsibilities to recompute the mixture model. So these are the gammas that you computed in the E step, and now you can basically recompute the mixing coefficients and the parameters of um, of the models belonging to individual clusters, if you want to say it like this. And that's basically, again, the same principle, right? You recompute the, uh, the responsibilities and you use that responsibilities to recompute these probabilities. And these probabilities will then be in the next iteration used again to compute the responsibilities anew. And those responsibilities will be used to compute the new values of those probabilities and parameters. So it is, again, this kind of structure where you use something to estimate something else and to use that else to estimate that something. And if you look uh, how this is used for Gaussian mixtures, I have an example here again. So let's assume that you have basically three components. Uh, each of those components is a Gaussian mixture. So here you have one uh, basically Gaussian mixture like this, right? So it's two-dimensional Gaussian mixture. Here you have another, and here you have another one. So you have three Gaussians, and you mix them with certain mixing coefficients. So there is a probability of each of those uh, coefficients. I, I don't know which uh, what the numbers were, but it doesn't matter now. And you use this probabilistic model to generate the data. How you can do that? You will just use this distribution to <coughs> uh, choose which of these components will be used to generate the data point, and then you use that, that normal distribution with that parameters to generate a single data point. So it's a two-stage procedure, but quite straightforward. Um, OK, so this is the actual EM algorithm for Gaussian mixture. It has the same structure here. You compute the responsibilities given the initial parameters of the normal distribution and those mixture coefficients. And then once you have those responsibilities, you recompute all those parameters of the probabilistic model. And if you apply it in practice, <coughs> so if you have this, these three Gaussians and the data points generated from that, this is when you know which of the components of the mixture generated the individual data points, OK? But once you get rid of this hidden information of the well, which cluster is responsible for each point, the data uh, looks like this, right? So there is no color, no information about which uh, Gaussian generated each data point. And now you may want to try to recover this information. Which cluster is probably responsible for that data point? So you may start basically with almost random configuration of those three uh, Gaussian distributions. And you can see that the assignment is actually fuzzy because along these, these lines here, you should see some 
not clear red, green or blue colors, but some intermediate ones. And that means that it is very unclear which of those three uh, clusters actually is responsible for the data point. And if you apply this EM algorithm for the solution mixture on it, you can see this evolution of, of shapes, those Gaussians. And in the end, we should end up in a situation that is very similar to the generating case, right? So this was the basically generator for which the data were gener from which the data were generated, and this is the recovered or estimated state. And uh, when I prepared this example some years ago, I remember that it took me some time to actually get to this nice state because uh, as I have already said, EM is just local algorithm. It does not guarantee the globally optimal solutions. So uh, we were actually lucky that the EM converged to the right local optimum of the likelihood function, such that the result is almost undis uh, undiscernible from the source. Uh, okay, so I'm already four minutes late again, but I would like to talk a few minutes also about the EM algorithm for the hidden Markov model, which is the Baum-Welsh algorithm. And this is just, yeah, the reiteration of the hidden Markov models, what they are, what are the states and observations. And yeah, now we solve basically the sixth task that we defined for the hidden uh, Markov models, whether it is possible to learn hidden Markov models from data. And the Baum-Welsh algorithm, a special case of EM, is the answer to this question. So yes, it is possible you can use this algorithm to train hidden Markov models or fit hidden Markov models to the data that you have available. Um, in the few slides that are remaining, I will use slightly different notation for those probabilities and transition and emission model. So I will use a matrix A to denote the transition model. I will use matrix B to denote the emission model but they are really just these conditional probabilities. And I will use pi as the prior, uh, prior probabilities. Why I do that? Well, because this notation is quite uh, usual when you describe the Baum-Welsh algorithm in, in articles, etc. And these parameters are very short and we will need a short description as you will see. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the whole hidden Markov model is basically given by this set of parameters, right? Theta, which is the priors, the transition model and the emission model. And the EM algorithm will try to find a new value, some new values of the same parameters, such that the probability of the observed data, of the ob observation sequence, given the new parameters of the model is larger than the uh, probability of the old, uh, well, the probability when using the old values. Um, okay, the Baum-Welsh algorithm uses uh, what is called sufficient statistics. It uses these uh, 
what is this xi or and gamma. And these are some quantities computed from the model parameters and those these values alpha and beta and basically alphas and betas are the forward and backward messages computed for the for uh, from the forward backward algorithm so to use Baumwelsch algorithm to estimate the model parameters you need to compute those and backward messages for forward Using them, you can compute these sufficient statistics, which is thinking those responsibilities from the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixture models, for example. Um, okay, these quantities, these variables have a meaning. This psi t of ij is basically a probability of transition from state si at time t to state sj at time t plus one given the model and the observation sequence and yeah you can actually check that uh, it can be computed using these forward and backward probabilities using the transition model, using the emission model, and just normalized by this probability. And the other sufficient statistics, these gamma t's, are basically the probability of being in a state as i at time t. And so this is the let's say recognition part or part of the E step. And then in the second step, you will use these computed quantities to recompute those pi, aij and bjk's. So these are the re-estimation formulas basically. So you can use basically these computed sufficient statistics to recompute the new values of the model parameters. So yeah, the whole thing is quite simple if you know how to do that. And if you, uh, if you realize clearly what the individual variables actually are and how they can be computed. Otherwise, the procedure is quite uh, quite simple, I would say. Nevertheless, I read many things can be wrong if you try to implement. It. There is a chance of making an error. Uh, we will not implement this Baumwelsch algorithm during the lab or seminars. Uh, but you can try to do that in your semestral task where it is uh, where it is offered as one of the bonus part which brings you some additional points and that's it basically so in this part of the lecture we I have tried to introduce very quickly the EM algorithm, uh, which is an algorithm to compute the maximum likelihood estimate of probabilistic models if some parts of the data is not observable or is missing. And we have seen, let's say, like three examples or three particular instances of EM algorithm. We have seen k-means, which is a kind of degenerate EM algorithm. We have seen EM algorithm for Gaussian mixtures, and we have seen EM algorithm for hidden Markov models. All of them share very common uh, features because they are all instances of the same high-level algorithm, which is called expectation maximization. 
And that's it. So I'm sorry for being too long again, but I really wanted to finish this topic just to have the opportunity to pass the lectures to Radek Marik next week. So thank you for your attention and see you in the future somewhere. <laughs>